Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the LSE for this hybrid event hosted by the Department of Accounting. My name is Maria Correa. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Accounting here at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and I will be sharing this session. I'm very pleased to welcome both our online audience and our audience here at the Sheikh Zayed Theatre today. I'm also very pleased to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Christian Lloyds. Professor Lloyds is the Charles F. Poole Distinguished Service Professor of Accounting and Finance at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business. He's an associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a fellow at the Center for Economic Policy uh, Research, the European Corporate Governance Institute, the Goethe University Frankfurt Center for Financial Studies, and the SES IFO Research Network. He's also a co-organizer and member of the IGM's European Economic Experts Panel. He has extensively studied the role of disclosure and transparency in capital markets and in other settings, including sustainability and ESG. He has won numerous research awards, is recognized as a highly cited researcher by Thomson Reuters, and he was included in their list for the world's most influential scientific minds five years in a row. So today, Professor Lloyd will be talking about how we can leverage transparency to the betterment of society, which, as we know, as you may know, directly speaks to the LSE's founding purpose. He will be discussing what we know about the role and effectiveness of transparency regimes that target particular corporate activities uh, by shining a light on them. This is a very relevant topic, especially in the context of sustainability, as many countries are increasingly requiring firms to report on their impact on the environment. Professor Lloyds will speak for approximately 45 minutes. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Professor Lloyds. For our online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the top left of your screen. Please let us know your name and affiliation. We are particularly keen to hear from our students and for our, from our alumni as well. For those here in the theater, I will let you know uh, when we will open the floor for questions. Uh, if you raise your hand and wait for a microphone, I will then ask you to provide your name and your affiliation uh, before posing your question. And I will try to ensure that there is a range of questions from the online audience and from the audience here at the Sheikh Zayed Theater. For those of you who are Twitter users, uh, the hashtag for today's event is LSC Sustainability. This event is being recorded. It will hopefully be made available as a podcast, subject to no technical difficulties. But now I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Christian Lloyds. Uh, thank you, Christian. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, thank you, Maria, and thanks also, Annie, for the invitation, the uh, entire accounting group and, and also LSE for this um, public lecture. And thank you all for coming, especially the students really appreciate the uh, large turnout and having the opportunity to share some thoughts and some, some research with you. As Maria said, the topic for tonight is how can we leverage transparency to the betterment of society? And when you think about this topic, one thing that comes to mind is a term that I'm sure you've all have heard in recent years, uh, which is this term ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Issues. And it was kind of created in 2004 by a UN report and since this has taken off. But it turns out that this question for the talk tonight, how transparency can be used for the betterment of society, has actually been around for quite a while. And a very similar question was uh, posed by Supreme Court Justice Brandeis in, uh, you know, over 100 years ago in 1913 in Harper's Weekly when he was posing this question, what publicity can do, and he commented early on in his article that publicity is justly commended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases. When you think about what those are, those are the E's and S that we're debating today. And sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. So this is what we're going to talk about tonight. So 
thinking about sunlight for industrial and social diseases, when we go back in history and we look at like how we have used transparency or sunlight for this as a policy tool, we find that it actually has a pretty long tradition. So giving you a couple US examples here. So in 1906, it was the Pure Food and, um, Food and Drug Act to improve food safety. In the 30s, and you know, we had the Securities and Exchange Acts, which were created for the Securities Act uh, for the securities markets to uh, reduce financial malfeasance. And then we have the 1986 Toxic Release Inventory that was created by a really long name, uh, but essentially. The Community Right to Know Act is essentially, again, a transparency regime where companies have to release information about toxic substances that they're um, releasing into the environment. And then another example of a more of a social uh, disease, the 2010 Affordable Care Act requires calories to combat uh, obesity. There's many, many other examples, consumer protection, conflicts of interest, campaign contributions, and so on. Now, if we ask what's more of these issues, these societal and industrial diseases, we kind of, I think, as economists would very quickly realize that these are market failures, they're basically externalities. Now, in this audience, you know, it probably won't have to um, define this, but many would be familiar that we speak about an externality, in particular a negative externality, when the social costs exceed the private costs, and the prime example of this would be pollution, right? So if you think about it, think about CO2 emissions, right? Companies, if they release CO2 into the atmosphere for free, then there is sort of no cost to the firm, but there is significant damages to society from the CO2 emissions that are released into the atmosphere. And as a result of this type of a negative externality, you're going to get overproduction, overuse, of common goods um, and so on. So now, what can we do about these externalities? And turns out that this is not something that is you know, new. If, if you go back in, in economics, there's sort of long-standing research on this matter. And me coming from the University of Chicago, you probably expect me to first talk about market uh, solutions or laissez-faire, simply letting the parties sort it out, which we would call cozy and bargaining. Now, cozy and bargaining typically works well or could be a solution if there's well-defined property rights, we have low bargaining costs, and importantly, no information asymmetry. And that's something that I'm going to come back to um, in a, a little while. Now, most of the time, these conditions probably won't hold, and we'll have extensive government regulation when it comes to uh, the environment. And there have basically been three policy waves in environmental policy. The first one was essentially limiting or prohibiting pollution, so telling companies how much they can emit of a certain substance. Then there's market-based strategies such as carbon taxes, cap and trade, but also subsidies, right, where we're basically trying to use incentives and then have firms basically find ways to avoid their externalities. But then there's been a third wave, and that's kind of the topic for tonight, which is mandatory disclosure or information-based strategies where the idea is, and this goes back again to Brandeis' of Sunlight, that we're driving change through transparency and um, by shining light or targeting specific corporate activities. Now, the broader notion in today's context is probably this push for sustainability reporting that many of you will probably be aware of. And this has been a key strategy for climate. So when, for instance, the Financial Stability Board was thinking about climate, one of the first things they did was they created this task force on climate-related financial disclosures. All right, so again, you see that sort of in recent years, um, disclosure strategies have been used quite extensively. And here is one study where they basically track these various disclosure regimes and they say by 2020, we have more than 600 disclosure provisions around the world when it comes to sustainability reporting. Some of them are voluntary, others of them are mandatory, and there's, you know, they're basically in close to, you know, what is this, 80, uh, 90 countries or so. So why do we see this push for sustainability reporting, you know, at this moment? I think one reason is, aside from we need data and we you know, there's sort of this natural first step that we want information is probably a frustration that a lot of the traditional tools seem to fail in this space. 
The climate problem is a global problem, and we have pretty complicated politics between the developed countries and the developing countries if you think about what cumulatively the emissions have been and where we're going to see future energy demand if the developing countries of the global south is going to be developing. Right? Those things make, um, and, and that distribution or distributional issues make the solution pretty difficult. A global carbon tax that would be sort of attracting or, or, or covering everybody doesn't seem to be in the cards at the moment. Now, <clears throat> there, therefore, I think this response that we're seeing with sustainability reporting is the core of this is probably this idea of Brandeis that we're trying to drive change through transparency because this is probably the area where at the moment we see the fastest movement. Right? So if you think about the um, ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, it was created last year. We already have standards this year, and there seems to be quite a bit of global support for the ISSB. We see it in the EU, we see it in the, in the US, and the UK also has a disclosure mandate. Right? So there's a lot of um, support for sustainability reporting. Now, what's the appeal of this targeted transparency? One would be this idea that we're relying on the power of information, which, again, in this you know, sort of day and age makes a lot of sense with the falling cost of information collection, dissemination, and aggregation. It seems apt that we're using information regimes when the cost of information production and dissemination are falling. Secondly, it also seems that it's less intrusive. Right? We've learned from some of the command and control policies that they have unintended consequences. And so people, I think, often think, you know what, these transparency regimes, they're less uh, prescriptive. They don't tell people what they have to do, what they can't do. They just let them do whatever they want to do, but then they have to disclose. And we'll come back to whether that means that we should expect to see less unintended consequences. And then lastly, is probably a political motive. It's going to be politically more expedient often because it's hard for the regulated parties to argue against transparency, right? Transparency is viewed as a positive thing, and so it's very hard to say, you know, no, we'd rather keep things in the dark, right? And so in that sense, um, it's, it's sort of, if, if you take these sort of three reasons, you, you can kind of see why targeted transparency is probably on the rise, which leads to the question, maybe the accountants can save the world, right? Now, that's what I want to sort of talk a little bit more about, and let's think about the fundamentals here, sort of why and how information could be helpful. First of all, as I already alluded to, measurement and data are going to be key to any policy. Right? We need to have a sense for um, measuring the externalities, and more importantly, I would even argue often, we don't even know whether there are externalities if we don't have the data and don't let sort of science figure out where the impacts are. So a pretty important aspect of data and measurement is going to be to promote scientific discovery of what some of these impacts are. And again, it's going to be a point to which I come back. Secondly, there is information asymmetry. If you think about who knows best, probably, or better about these potential impacts that firm activities are going to have, it's going to be the firms. Right? And so the question then becomes, what incentive do they have us to tell us about these environmental impacts? And so transparency regimes could have one appealing feature, which is they're going to push back, they're going to level the playing field somewhat with regard to these potential impacts from corporate activities. And in particular, we could think about transparency regimes potentially as a quid pro quo for the license to operate. And so I'll come back to this idea towards the end of, of the talk. And then, again, you can tell that I love that little picture, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, exposing corporate activities by sunlight, this is a much more active idea, right? Where we're now really shining the light, targeting certain activities, and then the, presumably the idea is that we're going to try to create public pressure. So let's look at this mechanism for a moment. How does sunlight work? How, how does this mechanism, the, the Brandeis idea, work? Now, the traditional um, policies they regulate quantities. Again, they tell you how much you can emit or um, pollute or uh, release into the environment. So there the focus is on quantities. The transparency mechanism is closer to a market-based mechanism because it uses prices. Right? But they're not traditional prices as in the market-based strategy. It's not a cap and trade or a, a carbon tax. It's essentially what I'm having here is where the firm provides information 
The stakeholders receive that information and then they respond to that information and that response could impose a price on um, the companies. Now, where we have some evidence to what extent, you know, where, where there is potentially this cost or this, this price imposed on the firm is in the context of public shaming. So there's a number of studies that show that public shaming can impose costs on firms and then firms will change their actions. And so we have some evidence on tax avoidance, which is actually from the UK, where a nonprofit, uh, uh, now I'm blanking on the name Action Aid, I think they were called, where they were basically shaming companies for having uh, subsidiaries in uh, tax havens. And then that basically changed uh, and increased the tax rates or the effective tax rate that firms were paying uh, to the government. There's some work on mine safety disclosures where basically the Dodd-Frank Act included mine safety disclosures in the 10K filings. So in the financial reports, they had to also report on accidents and injuries. And you can, you know, there's, there's work by uh, Christensen et al. that basically shows that then subsequently accidents and in injuries uh, go down when this dissemination was created through the Dodd-Frank Act. And there's some recent work also on work safety violations where the U.S. regulator called OSHA was essentially using a public press release strategy to disseminate uh, violations. Now, what these studies have in common is that they're all about bad conduct or where firms, in essence, were caught. And that, in my mind, is um, a little different than what some of the environmental and social problems that we're talk talking about, which often might be quite dispersed in their effects. So what isn't obvious to me, and it's a question that I've for years have sort of been thinking about or, or trying to find sort of a setting to study, is this question is, does this mechanism work for dispersed externalities where the impacts aren't felt sort of immediately or sort of by many, right? And the classic example, again, would be CO2 emissions where, you know, each ton of carbon does cause damages, but it's not something that each and every one of us kind of immediately feels. It sort of only adds up over time and in the aggregate. Same with water pollution. Um, it probably sort of affects a larger community, but sort of individually it's not exactly clear that anybody would have sort of the incentive to then react to this, um, to this phenomena. So it creates collective action problems. So then the question becomes, uh, would public pressure be large enough to work for these externalities, right? It's different from the shaming mechanism where you're explicitly sort of exposing a particular behavior that maybe society considers pretty bad. It's not clear that you would have the same idea that, a, you know, a CO2 emission, you'd have the same sort of negative connotation, at least not uh, until perhaps very recently. Now, the setting that um, some co-authors of mine, Joanna Michelon and Pietro Bonetti, came across was this fracking um, setting. And so uh, I'll explain in a moment, if you're not familiar with hydraulic fracturing, w how this works and what it is in a moment. But the reason we wanted to study fracturing was because the U.S. states around 2010 started introducing disclosure mandates for the fracking industry. And the, um, there was a major sort of environmental debate over the potential impacts that fracking could have. In particular, the fluids that they're pumping into the ground and the wastewater that ultimately lets, uh, needs to be collected. And so the fracking operators were asked to disclose where they drill and what they use as fracking fluids. So let me explain a little bit more about fracking and then we'll come back to the um, disclosure question. So this is how fracking works. It's actually quite an, uh, an engineering feat in the sense that they drill two to 3,000 uh, yeah, meters into the deep shale. So this down here is essentially the shale. And if you haven't seen shale, um, I happen to have uh, been to a fracking site and they had sort of pieces of shale. It looks like a brake pad from a car. It's like really black, dark, um, and very thick matter. And so, in the, so it's very different from a sort of vertical or natural um, oil and gas field is you basically, the, the, the oil and gas is trapped in, that, in this, in this uh, shale. And so what they then do is they drill horizontally for two or three kilometers, sometimes even further, and then they push with very high pressure water, sand, and various other propens and other chemicals into this bore uh, 
well or into this well to basically fracture the um, the shale, and then that is what ultimately re releases the oil and gas. And the way they capture it is is the fluids, the, and there's also water in the deep formation comes back up, and then that needs to be collected. And so when I first started this, you know, I was sort of wondering as to what extent stuff could bubble up here, but that's not happening. It's like these formations are super dense. The bigger issue is this needs to be again when the oil and gas production happens. This needs to be collected, and a lot of water is produced early in the production stage when they open up the well and they start the production, and all this wastewater is coming out. So th that's sort of why we were like, okay, this seems to target a particular activity at a time, and especially about those fluids and wastewaters that are a critical concern. And so then we were like, well, let's see whether transparency for these uh, operators reduces the environmental impact. That was kind of our research question. Now, when you study transparency you, or disclosure regimes, one of the things you need to realize is it's not um, trivial to find a setting because if what you need in order to see whether there was a change is what the pre-period behavior was, right, before the disclosure mandate is introduced. But if it's easy for me as a researcher to see what they were doing before, then everybody else can. And then the transparency regime doesn't really introduce anything new. Right? So the other thing that we thought was clever here is that we're, we're going to look at water pollution. It's something, again, that I said is quite dispersed. It's not so easy to measure for kind of like uh, anybody. And in that sense, um, it might be a setting where we can use the or look at the pre-period behavior and then can study water pollution before and after and learn something about the transparency regime. So off we went, we collected some data, you know, water measurements and so on. Um, and then right when we were kind of working on all of this, trying to understand, the EPA comes out with a report and basically says, they looked at all the evidence that's out there. There isn't sort of much evidence for a systematic link. There's some evidence of, you know, isolated incidences, basically, you know, leaks and accidents and so on but no evidence of systematic or widespread contamination, right? And then we were like, okay, there goes our study because, you know, again, you need kind of this link. Luckily, we'd already collected some data, and so we were seeing some trends in our data where when we looked at watersheds where there was fracking versus watersheds where there was no fracking, we saw upward trends in chemicals that are signatures for fracking if and when there's impact. So there's a couple of these um, these salts, essentially, they're barium, bromide, chloride, and strontium that are very in, in recently high concentrations in both the flak, frac fluids that are pushed in as well as in the deep formations in the water that comes back up. And so in that sense, is that's what scientists, the geologists, and so on use when they're trying to see whether there's impact. So we had data on those. We tracked the salts, and we were seeing this upward trend. So then we were like, oh, maybe the thing what we should first do is study the water impact, create the link, and then we come back to the transparency question. And that's what we did. So in 2021, we published a paper in Science that basically established the link between fracking and surface water impact. And we show there that there's um, systematic increases in the salt concentrations that I was just telling you about for several shales and many of the U.S. watersheds. So it's not just like in a few places. It's essentially on all these major shales as well as in many of the U.S. watersheds. And in particular, we did a lot to kind of basically show that it really is linked to the hydraulic fracturing activity. We, for instance, show that the effects are much larger in the 90 to 180 days when you get a pop and effects that are orders of magnitude larger than what you're getting if you're just looking for the long run association in that window. And the reason that window is really meaningful here is it takes about 100 days from the start of the drilling to when they normally open up the well and then the wastewater and the fluid come back out and the oil and gas production starts. And that's right when all the four salts were basically popping. And so that picture was kind of what got everybody's attention and probably was uh, critical for you know, the paper getting published. There's one other thing I want to show you, and this is a, a distance gradient. And so let's first look at the you know, tail end of this, this graph. We're basically looking at all measurements from, that are within zero to 30 kilometers from them. And then we're going closer to the well, and so here you get a significant effect. Again, these are small increases, and you're getting a significant effect. And as you're going closer, 
you, something that you should expect or would expect to see, which is that the impact gets larger and quite a bit as you go closer and closer. That's what you would expect of this is the causal effect. But notice the other thing. The standard errors get huge, right? The confidence interval gets really wide. So at the closest monitors, we, you know, from a statistical perspective, we can't even say that this would be statistically significant at conventional levels. The reason I show you this is it shows the importance of data and measurement because we're not measuring where you'd want to measure and where you'd want to, to kind of have most of the measurements if you're really wanting to figure out whether fracking has this impact. Right? We have a lot more measurements that are way out there that happen for other reasons than right before and after a well gets fracked as well as really close in the surface waters around it. Right? The U.S. has since sort of created rules for uh, groundwater where, and then not surprisingly and consistent with these results, there's been more recent studies that basically also find um, groundwater uh, impacts as well. Yes? What did the EPA research? What is your hypothesis? Well, this, is, this is a really good question. Let's actually take, come back to that later. It, it's kind of a project that we want to work on now. So you're going, your mind goes exactly where our mind was, and I'll tell you a little story about uh, this in, uh, in a little bit. Okay, so then once we had that, we were now had the link, right? We can come back to the transparency study. So we basically um, look at these transparency regimes, and this is what you get basically uh, if you um, look at before and after and what's really nice about these disclosure mandates, they were rolled out at different points in time in the various U.S. states. And so if you're thinking, well, maybe one of the things that's happening here is technological improvements over time, you know, what we're showing you here by aligning everything in event time is that the improvements happen pretty much right after the disclosure mandates get introduced, right? So, um, and the effects are on the order of 9 to 15%, depending on which of the, the salts you're, you're looking at. Now, we also can show that there's less pollution per well, um, that there's reduced use of toxic chemicals when we benchmark against some voluntary disclosures, as well as fewer spills and leaks. That is probably, if you ask me what's the primary mechanism, it's probably that one because the leaks and spills are probably a key reason or way how these wastewaters and fluids get into uh, the surface waters. Now, this would suggest that you know, there is sort of improvements in the, in, the, in the operator's practices. And what's cool about this setting, you can actually drill much deeper in terms of how does transparency actually work? What's the, me the transparency mechanism here? So one thing that we looked at is do the disclosure rules increase sort of things that you would associate with more publicity or transparency? So we can show that Google searches go up news coverage that is often negative about the fracking goes up. And then we added one result to the paper very recently that I'm quite excited about. We find that there's more volunteers to the local NGOs. And so that basically, um, you know, these are kind of anti-fracking groups that sit in the various watersheds. And you see more people signing up to sort of help, uh, in, in these, uh, for these NGOs. And then we kind of look at the effects and we also find larger water pollution reductions exactly sort of consistent with those results where there's greater media presence, where there's an increase in the Google search and the news. I forgot to put on here this also where there's more of these local uh, anti-fracking NGOs as well as you know, publicly traded operators which presumably would be subject to more of this publicity concern. So in that sense, uh, this is kind of you know, good news for the idea of driving you know, change for, for externalities. There's another cool study that I want to tell you about, which um, one of our students did a couple of years ago, uh, Saurabh Tomar, and he looked at um, another dispersed externality, greenhouse gas emissions, and looked at facilities that are under the U.S. greenhouse gas reporting program, which are basically uh, large emitters of, of greenhouse gas. And what's cool about it is, is that Again, it's about, like, when you do these transparency studies, you need to find a way to study the pre-period behavior. And so what he, the idea he had, or what he figured out, is that there was no prior reporting of CO2. If there was, then again, the change here would not be all that meaningful. But there was a carbon monoxide reporting regime prior to that. And when you burn fuel, there's actually, depending on the process that you're, you're looking at, 
There's a physical relation between the carbon monoxide and the carbon um, dioxide. And so he was basically, once he had the CO2 emissions, he was able to establish that link. But note, you could not have done this, or anybody could have done this prior to the disclosure agreement. It's only once the CO2 became mandatory, you would be, would be able to estimate what the CO2 was, and then you could do this also for the pre-period and then study the pre and post, right? So it's a very clever uh, study, and he finds effects on the order, again, of 8% following the disclosure mandate, quite consistent with uh, our magnitudes. And he also has some evidence on the mechanism, and in this case, it seems like there's firm learning from the peers that uh, seems to spur these emission reductions. So... This brings us to the question, you know, um, that I think we can kind of conclude from at first that we can drive change and we can have meaningful impact. So 8 to 15 percent is not nothing. But it's not clear that, the, first of all, that that's going to solve the climate problem if we're thinking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it's also not clear just because it works that that means that that's what you should be using, right? So we can ask the question, is it effective to do so? And so for this, I think it's very important to kind of come back to the mechanism and say, let's understand why we're getting these effects. So again, I was telling you that the targeted transparency mechanism uses these stakeholder responses, right? The prices that the stakeholders impose. Now, what you should note about this is that these stakeholder responses are presumably hard to foresee because there's lots of stakeholders. Just once you disclose, anybody can use this information, right? Secondly, the responses are going to also depend on the stakeholder preferences. It really depends on how much they care. And like for a lot of these things, you know, maybe tax avoidance and, uh, you know, work safety violations and so on, you can kind of, you know, maybe assume that nobody likes these things, right? But I, it's not so clear, again, when we talk about externalities, that, that that's a, a fair assumption. Because addressing externalities typically costs money, right? Think about if you are operating a process that's pretty expensive, uh, and creates lots of CO2 emissions, adding carbon capture to that process is probably not going to be free to you. In fact, very likely not, right? So in that sense, then if it costs money, it probably reduces profits, it reduces returns, which brings me to the question, do shareholders really have an interest in reducing these externalities? I mean, there's a reason why our environment is a dire state to begin with, right? And so I want to show you one... Um, survey here among institutional investors where they basically asked the question to what extent shareholders would be willing to forego returns for societal and environmental benefit, exactly the kind of issues that we're talking about, and 49% disagree. And if you sort of then look among the ones that would be willing to forego, there's another 30 or so percent that basically would only be willing to make relatively small return concessions. Right? That's not such great news in terms of the additional investments that might be required to really address um, sustainability issues. You can go one step further and ask, well, what if these stakeholders even you know, don't like ESG? I mean, I don't know whether you follow this, but in the US, there's a massive anti-ESG debate that we're now having where several of the states are trying to create legislation that would, you know, for instance, prevent the state pension funds to use ESG criteria and various other uh, measures. Now, if that's the case, then you could even get the opposite result where the stakeholder responses might drive the firm in the direction that you don't really want from a societal perspective. The next thing that might pop in your head, you say, well, okay, let's forget about the anti-ESG people, but what about the pro-ESG people, right? The, the ones that might use a divestment mechanism this is one of the key strategies we see in finance at the moment in the ESG space is this idea that, you know, basically people either exclude certain stocks or tilt their portfolios in favor of ESG stocks that are sort of more having more favorable uh, ESG profiles. And the idea here would be we're starving the brown furs of capital and that in turn should drive down the value of the brown firms, raise their cost of capital and make it more difficult for them to invest in their brown technologies or even provide incentives for the green technology. That's the idea. Now, the problem is that capital markets are actually very elastic, right? There's lots of heterogeneity in these preferences, 
And so as the green investors sell the stock, bring down the price, you get a pretty quick response by other people who say, well, now at this price, I'm going to be willing to buy the stock. The undo or mute the response you're going to get from um, the, the divestment. And so in capital markets, it's going to be pretty difficult to get a large cost of capital response. Burke and Van, Spins Van Binsbergen have a, a fairly recent paper where they estimate that in order to get a 1% change in the cost of capital, you need the impact investors to control about 80% of the investable wealth. Right? This is sort of pretty telling. Now, we can quibble over whether that estimate is exactly right, and there's a couple other studies, but directionally, I think this, this idea is, 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 is right. So then you could say, well, okay, forget about the shareholders. What about the consumers? Right? And uh, there's lots of surveys that say consumers regularly express preferences for sustainable products. Um, when you survey Gen Zs and, and millennials, lots in the audience, people will say that they're willing to spend you know, up to 10% or more for uh, sustainable products. And there's also examples or anecdotes of these successful consumer buy, uh, boycotts or campaigns that then led to changes. And there's like one pretty known example is the Nestle Palm oil protests and, and boycotts. Now, this is obviously asking people. Right? And we know with surveys that people often have pretty aspirational answers. And then when it comes to their own money, we're not going to get necessarily the response that they were saying in the survey. So it's interesting and I think important to do studies that look at actual behavior, not just about sort of the, um, the, the, the professed um, preferences or aspirations. So here's one cool study that was done among university students in Munich where they convinced the cafeteria for two weeks to basically randomize the labeling of food, and they were providing various treatments. So they would provide some information on CO2, they would have some CO2 in color coding, they would monetize the CO2, um, and then they would also have some, uh, a budget treatment that I, I don't have time to get into. But basically what you see here with this randomized field experiment, which is kind of the, you know, the gold standard in in medicine and how we're trying to figure out treatment effects, you're getting treatment effects on the order of 5 to 8%. And the most effective one seems to have been the one where you, you express it in money terms and you color code and make it pretty visible. Right? I'm going to come back to the, uh, the, the, the money, uh, the, the monetization of the impact uh, in a little while. So this would be saying you're going to get potentially consumers to change their consumption behavior. And um, what we don't know here, however, this was done for two weeks, and that's often the case with these experiments. It's sort of hard to know what general equilibrium or long-run effects would really be. There's some other studies, and one of uh, the studies is actually by somebody in the audience, Henri Serres. Um, he has, they have sort of really fantastic um, sort of barcode or scanner data or con consumption data, and they basically try to see whether... Uh, the, the, the consumers would act on positive ESG product ratings. And again, we're seeing results that are consistent with what I was showing you on the previous slide. In this case, you can actually also look for, you know, sort of longer run uh, consumption effects. But when you look at company news, and this is what we're the primary thing that we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability reporting, the evidence is at best mixed and quite different, right? So again, there are some studies that would uh, suggest you're going to get effects. They're using scanner data, uh, foot traffic in retail stores, and they're doing this sort of analysis around negative ESG events. So there's basically something bad happening for the farm. It comes out, and then they're looking, do consumers now punish the farm, right? And they find negative effects, but what's important, and this is kind of brings me back to what I was starting with, is that it happens only in certain pockets of the population. It happens among the wealthier households, the ones that are ESG conscious, and the economic magnitudes are pretty small, and the effects are often quite short-lived, right? And so what I'm taking away from this evidence is that there's lots of heterogeneity among consumer responses, and if you're trying to drive change with transparency, you need to think carefully about these preferences because of this heterogeneity. And the other thing we're learning from these studies is that the visibility is actually very important, too. The more visible these events are, the uh, bigger the, the response is going to be. So takeaway, I think, so far has been mechanism is really key, but the stakeholder-imposed costs are probably not what we would call a Pigouvian tax. Right? What's a Pigouvian tax? 
It's this idea that with the Pigouvian tax, you're closing the gap between the social cost and the private cost so that you undo the externality. Right? That's the idea. It's been around for a long, long time. You know, based on this evidence, it's going to be hard to see that this is going to be as big as you know, the, an effect you could induce with if you truly had a carbon tax. And it's fully consistent with this idea that I was telling you earlier what the appeal of targeted transparency is, that people feel like it's less intrusive, right? And there's probably a reason for that. Now, what we also take away is that public pressure works. And here I want to again sort of also pose another question mark, which is it seems like media and NGOs and sort of this, you know, public or publicity consistent with Brandeis' idea is important. But when is that highest? It's highest right when these regimes get introduced, when there's a big public debate. What isn't so obvious, does this still work three years, five years, 10 years down the line, right? One of the concerns I have with some of these uh, studies or things that we've looked at is that you get kind of an effect, but it's the low-hanging fruit. It's sort of like firms know you're dangling something much worse over them. You know, perhaps you're banning the fracking activity. They were like, okay, we better behave. They do something. But then the question is, is there really sort of a long-run response and a drive of the kind that we're going to need to uh, address the climate challenge? Now, here's one mechanism that I think is maybe the most promising in this regard. And this is this idea of peer benchmarking. Right? Because one of the things that reporting does, it exposes the heterogeneity among firms. And nobody wants to be the dirtiest kid on the block. On top of that, the peer benchmarking also allows you to look at year-over-year -year improvements. And this is where you, you can see how you get continued responses by the firms because you're going to look like, what did you have last year, what do you have this year, and so on. Now, there's one other effect that I like about this, which is that the ex post disclosure, knowing that you have to say what your carbon emissions were factually, will also discipline what you say ex ante. And we have some work in financial accounting that would be uh, supporting this idea which is very important for all these net zero pledges that a firm making at the moment, is if they know that they subsequently has to have to report about them in a standardized way, level playing field for everybody. So in my mind, especially in the carbon space, I think benchmarking is indeed a promising transparency mechanism. But here, again, we should ask the same question I was asking about these other studies before, is like how big do we think is the potential of peer benchmarking? And so we did a study that... Um, uh, Mike Greenstone, who I've heard has recently been here, uh, and Patricia Broya, who is in, uh, in, uh, in accounting now at Rotterdam, uh, we were doing together, where we were basically taking a large database of carbon emissions, some estimated, some reported, and we monetized them. And this idea of monetization is not something we came up with. It's been around for a long, long time. So what, we're, what we basically use is the scope one emissions. These are the direct emissions from the firm. We multiply them with the social cost of carbon to kind of get a dollar figure of what this means in terms of, of damages. And the reason I think monetization is important because if I told you that a plant had a million you know, uh, tons of, of carbon emissions, it's hard to know whether that's a lot or a little. So it's actually useful to first express this in dollar terms so that we can get a sense for how big the costs are. And so this co social cost of carbon is essentially the damages and the costs that are associated with an additional cost with an additional, it should actually say, ton of carbon here, not cost, that are released into the atmosphere, right? So does anybody have an idea how large this is? Just shout out a number. Sorry? 200. 200, 200. He's, he's an expert. Lewis is an expert. 200 is, is close to what the Biden administration now uses, what many of the estimates at the moment are, but there's a huge range. Estimating this is very, very difficult. Right. The uh, Obama administration used 51, and there are some estimates that go over, well over 200. Right? So th that's sort of the first step. But in order to get the peer benchmarking, what you also need to do is make it comparable across firms. So we scale it by the operating profits, because again, even if I told you it was you know, 10 million, it wouldn't mean much unless I know, is this a big firm that we're talking about? Is it a small firm? So we basically scale it by the operating profits, which you can think about it if the monetized carbon emissions are the damages, the profits are basically the private value that they create from their activities, and then we can compare the two, right? So we, we did this, and basically that paper just came out in, in science where we basically find that the carbon damages are large. They're 44% of firm operating profits on average. Now, 
you should take that, we should be careful. This is kind of gives you the, the 1090 distribution of these carbon damages at 190, so close to Lewis's uh, $200 estimate. The median is only, th or only perhaps in, in, in quotes, is only 3% relative to the 44% that you're getting for the average. So what that's telling you, there's huge heterogeneity across firms. And anybody who's followed the space is not going to be surprised, right? There's certain industries like cement, power generation, that have massive carbon emissions, airlines, relative to some other industries that have much smaller ones. This brings me now to back to the peer benchmarking. Even if we now sort of home in on the sub-industries, peer groups in essence, you still see huge variation in these peer groups. And so what we're doing here is we take the ratio of firms that have very large damages. So think the 90th percentile of firms in a subgroup, and then the firms that are in the 10th percentile of that same subgroup. And then we're basically, or I'm computing here the ratio of the, the, the 90th percentile to the 10th percentile. And what that's showing you is that for many of these industries here, so I'm taking something like as narrow as motorcycle manufacturers, you're getting a ratio that's probably uh, six or seven, but in some of the others, you're having 10 to 20 times larger are the emissions of the firms towards the top relative to the bottom. In steel, it, that ratio is over 100, right? So what that's telling you, there's potential for peer benchmarking in bringing some of the firms in where other firms already are, sort of best practices and these comparisons. And so we, we do one sort of thought experiment just to, to kind of get a computational sort of handle on this, is what if all the firms that are above median carbon damages were to reduce their carbon damages to the median firm in their, in their subgroup, what would be the, the carbon savings we would get? And they're basically 50% is what the emissions would fall. You have a question? Yes. Louis, you're just basically naming one project after another that I want to do. So we haven't done this yet, but excellent question, exactly. And I think this is an obvious question you should look at. Um, yeah. I don't know yet. There's one paper I know by Joe, um, Joe Shapiro that seems to suggest for sort of manufacturing, there is a link between these um, manufacturing productivity, the like, you know, Shane Clino stuff, and what we're seeing here. Yeah. Um, okay, so... I've been pretty positive, so in the, uh, in, you know, to bring this to a close, let me sort of talk a little bit about what are some of the costs of these disclosure mandates. First of all, obviously collecting data you know, uh, and disclosing it is not going to be free. And the thing that we need to be careful about is that, first of all, firms don't necessarily have the systems in place. Right? You can assume every firm has an accounting system. They probably have a, an ERP system that tracks sort of monetary flows, but it's not so clear for environmental stuff. And especially the smaller firms might have higher cost due to fixed um, costs, or it might hurt them more. The other one is indirect costs. And here I want to talk about proprietary costs because in the, especially when it comes to climate and environment, we need innovation, right? It's going to be really critically important to have innovation to tackle the climate challenge. But many of the ESG disclosures that we're sort of asking firms to provide are pretty process-oriented, pretty granular, so it allows other firms to kind of copy. That's good from a technology diffusion perspective, right? Again, this idea of like everybody follows best practices, but it's not good for ex ante innovation incentives. And so you're going to have a trade-off. And so this study hasn't been done in the climate or, or environmental space, but we did a study on financial information where we basically tried to exploit variation within the EU in transparency regimes where firms have to reveal sort of their profits. And we basically find that there is a negative effect on innovation from these transparency regimes. So they're not free. And in particular, one of the things that we find is that there's concentration effects. So innovation moves to the larger firms, which given that we're also having discussions over market power and concentration, is in my mind a non-trivial cost to have in the back of your minds. There's also going to be unintended consequences, even though people think they're more benign. Uh, measurement is going to be one of the critical issues to worry about here, is getting the right incentives and stakeholder responses. It's going to be pretty important that we measure the things that matter and link to um, the externalities that we're trying to fix. And we know from you know, agency theory and, and, and the studies that have been done that we're going to get sort of tilts 
firm behavior in the direction of what gets measured, and then basically skimping on quality dimensions that are not measured and not disclosed. On top of that, I think we need to worry about uneven regulation. This is one that I don't think sometimes people are seeing because a lot of these regimes focus on publicly traded firms. But if you have the externalities lens, then the private firms matter too. Right? It, I think it makes sense to focus on public firms if what you have in mind is informing investors. But here we're trying to do something different. And so in that sense, um, to have sort of a level playing field is, is important. And you can also ask the question, are the securities regulators even the right sort of agencies to think about this if we're trying to address these social and industrial diseases? And here's some evidence that sort of supports that this uneven regulation can have unintended consequences. So this is a study by Thomas Rauder, one of my colleagues, that looks at extraction payment disclosures for mineral uh, and, and, and extractive or resource companies. And they basically had a regime uh, leveled on them, the European firms. And what, you're, what I'm showing you here, again, there's going to be a treatment effect. But what I'm showing you here is that some of the business that basically the European firms are not doing, the American firms are basically picking up. Right, so this is sort of this idea that we need to carefully think about leveling the playing field when we operate with these regimes. Final concern, and actually my biggest one at the moment, it's the red herring. And the red herring concern, in my mind, comes where I, th I think you can illustrate this maybe the best, is that disclosure could become a distraction if we're doing too many of these things at the, at the moment. Right? So the EU is going to introduce, or already has introduced, it's going to come online next year, the CSRD and their environmental sustainability reporting standards, they're going to introduce 100 new disclosure rules and 1,000 new data points. Right? This is where I'm a little worried that if we're sort of having this avalanche of, of information that potentially want to get you know, companies sort of reacting to all the costs and also lots of potentially unintended effects. Right? And ultimately, disclosure cannot be the only thing. If companies say we're exhausted because of all the disclosure stuff that we're doing, not doing, the other, doing other things, it's going to be a problem. So to conclude, I think what I was presenting is that disclosure is sort of back to the question, can we you know, use transparency for the betterment of society? I think the answer is a qualified yes. I think we can drive change. Uh, we can do it through this idea of targeting uh, certain activities, but it's not innocuous. It's not something that you know, it's going to be free or you know, we got to be pretty careful about these unintended consequences. And for that reason, I think we should focus on the key externalities, things like you know, greenhouse gas, biodiversity, and be a bit more careful about sort of rolling it out to, to everything. And the broader we make the regime, the more we have to worry about these unintended consequences. So for that reason, I would try to keep it simple, but then also make it broad. Right? By making it simple, it's going to be easier to say, and by the way, this applies to everybody, including the private firms and some of the maybe not so large firms. And again, I think it's motivated by this idea that private firms cause externalities as well. The other thing, and this is sort of a, 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 a final thought that I already mentioned early in the presentation, is that I think it's probably going to be a fact of life that corporate activities will have externalities of some form. Some of them can even be positive. And therefore, I think our first instinct often should not be to immediately prohibit these activities. And this idea of saying we're going to first come with some information is probably not such a bad idea because we want to encourage innovation. And so I think a notion that I like is this idea of extracting information in return for the license to operate. To basically say, look, you can do certain things, but here are certain concerns we have, and you therefore have to provide data so that scientists and the communities can study these effects and can learn about the potential externalities. And so my conclusion sort of overall would be, I think the goal should be to combine disclosure with other policies so that in the end it becomes the bedrock in the same way it, it has become for financial markets. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Christian, for your presentation. So we will now open the floor to Q&A. For those online, please type small questions, short questions into the Q&A box. Please make sure to include your name and affiliation. Um, for those here, we will be passing a, a microphone. Please raise your hand. We will take questions in rounds. We'll take two or three questions uh, at a time. 
perhaps before we, we start in the Q&A, Christian, I, I have a question for you. So in your talk, you've been fairly negative about the role of the finance channel. Is there no role for sustainable finance in the energy transition, for example? Yeah, so I want to be clear here that when I was negative about a, I was negative about a particular finance channel, which is this cost of capital channel, um, for the reasons that I've explained. But I do think that finance can play a pretty important role, and I would make a distinction between sort of what has, at least in recent years, a predominant form of ESG investing and financing sustainability. And so what I mean by that is if we think about what I think in a way has been somewhat lopsided in ESG investing has been the messaging to a lot of investors essentially promising them higher returns for ESG investments. And what that does in my mind, it creates unfair competition for projects that potentially really are going to move the dial when it comes to sustainability. So think about a lot of the projects that need to happen in developing countries or the global south where you know, I think also the consequences of the climate crisis are going to be felt uh, the most, is in, for many of these projects, again, externa addressing externalities costs money, we we'll probably need return concessions. And so if the alternative is we're telling people, oh, you can invest in these ESG funds and you're going to earn higher returns, I think we're going to find it difficult to sort of recruit many of the investors in the amount of capital that we need to mobilize in the private sector to basically finance the energy transition. So in, in, in that sense, I think there is a role, but I think it is important that we clearly communicate the economics and um, the sort of idea of externalities to people so that we can ultimately fund um, the projects that we need to fund for climate, energy transition, and so on. And that that's possible, we see in the green bond markets, right? In the green bond markets, we see that there are investors who are willing to make return concessions for credible investments in sustainability. And in that sense, I'm not negative uh, when it comes to the sort of uh, finance and the channel. That so we can open the floor for questions. We have a question here in front. Up front. Thank you. I'm uh, Richard McVie, an emeritus professor in the accounting department. A fascinating uh, lecture, Christian. Thank you. Something that crossed my mind from years of auditing, how do we make sure that we can believe the disclosures that are made? Uh, perhaps the most famous example in recent years has been the way Volkswagen were manipulating the data about the emissions from their cars. So doesn't every company have that incentive to cheat the system if they can get away with it? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Richard, and um, I agree. I want to actually connect it also with the thing I was just saying last. I mean, this idea that addressing externalities costs money is also exactly why greenwashing is an issue, right? Is that often it might be cheaper to sort of just claim certain things and, as opposed to making the, the costly investments, which then creates the question that I think you're getting towards is what can we do to address greenwashing? One you know, obvious solution for accounts is going to be some form of assurance. Uh, in the you know, ESG space, there is lots of assurance providers, not just the audit firms, there's various um, other providers. Now, um, where I think, again, we have to be a, a, a somewhat careful is, the, is sort of with the fixed cost argument that I was making earlier, right? So if we're imposing audit mandates on everybody, we're going to create sort of much higher cost burdens for the smaller firms relative to the larger firms. And could this have sort of unintended consequences when it comes to concentration? So, I mean, I don't think there is a simple solution here um, because the incentives are the way that you said they are. Um, and, um, you know, insurance, assurance is, is probably one mechanism. We can, you know, think about are there incentive mechanisms that we can, I think I could see financial markets are providing certain um, services. If you think about, again, green bonds, is where firms explicitly actually commit to certain um, 
ex post mechanisms where they bond that they're going to take the investments in certain places and then that that gets checked, which then uh, also allows them to get the return concession, which then makes it feasible for them to pay for the assurance. So I think we should also think about those mechanisms, not just sort of imposing the, uh, the assurance mandate. I believe we have some questions from our online audience. So Dr. Stefano Cascino uh, will read some of those questions for us. So there is a question from uh, Paul Biniski from uh, Bayes Business School uh, for Christian. Do you see the risk of, quote unquote, too much ESG disclosure? We observe something similar with annual reports growing to hundreds of pages and getting harder to digest. Can there be too much of a good thing? Um, I mean, I guess the, in part the, the lecture was trying to sort of make the point uh, that, uh, that those costs can be meaningful. And it's kind of like my, my red herring uh, slide was, was in part, I think, going in this direction. Is, is if we provide too much information um, or if we provide, let's say first before we say too much because that's a judgment, but if we provide lots of information, it needs to be processed. Information processing isn't costly. If we add some assurance, it's you know, going to become even more costly. So in the sense is, is again, my, guard, my yardstick here or my guideline would be to say, let's focus on, on things that have externalities, clear externalities, and use the mechanism judiciously rather than sort of roll out regimes for everything um, because I think there can be, A, the backlash from companies, and, again, we need the investments. For other things, it can't just be a disclosure solution. We need more. Perhaps we can take some more questions from the audience here. We have one here in front. Henri Servas, Professor of Finance at London Business School. Thanks, Christian, for a great presentation. I have two questions, if I may. So, sure. You know, uh, one is, is I'd love to hear your take on uh, ex linking executive compensation to, to ESG uh, and, and you know, whether ultimately that's a positive thing or whether this just leads to highly paid executives getting paid even more for reaching goals that they were going to reach anyway. Um, and then the other, so unrelated, but it goes to your point on innovation and small and large firms. If you take this further, emissions, of course, have no borders. If we place all these disclosures on, you know, companies in the U.S. or in Europe, is there a chance that total emissions worldwide are just not going to change at all, but, the, you know, things are just going to happen in other countries and, and regulations are, are not there? And what, if anything, can be done to, to deal with that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, both of these are, are great questions. I think on the linking um, executive compensation to ESG, I think you can kind of give two answers, and it depends a little bit on you know, your starting point. So if you're in the camp where there's lots of people who are basically making the argument that sustainability will pay off in the long run because eventually society is going to internalize the externalities, and so if you sort of have a long enough of a horizon you know, maybe it makes sense for you to do these sort of sustainability investments in the first place. If that's your view, then I actually think it's not so obvious to me that you need to link compensation to uh, ESG metrics because one of the, the things we're using extensively for executives is we're linking them to share price. And in particular, if, you know, if we think about equity, you know, we're discounting equity over many, many years. It's, it includes the, the future, you know, cash flows. And in that sense, they, there should be that incentive by giving them long-term equity compensation, right? But then if you take the externalities perspective that I was giving you earlier, I'm saying, look, shareholders don't necessarily have the incentive to make these investments. And markets often are more short-term. And firms might care more about what's happening in the next six months or the next year than they're thinking about the long run then giving explicit targets on, for ESG or certain sustainability metrics can, I think, be a meaningful thing. We just, again, have to be very careful of what Richard was saying, is, is that we're really taking the measurement seriously, right? I want to give you one other example that is sort of, has nothing to do with executive compensation, but it's a great example for, like, how measurement is tricky. So there's this fantastic study by Dranoff et al. in the JPE 
that basically looks at cardiac surgery report cards. And the people who've heard me talk before probably have heard this example, but it's a great example to sort of drive home the point about measurement. And so they basically report on outcomes from cardiac surgery, like infections, mortality rates, and so on. And so the study finds, again, that there's a small treatment effect when that transparency regime gets introduced, meaning that mortality goes down, infection rates go down. But then when they look at where the effect is coming from, it's coming from largely surgeons basically selecting patients when, who they operate on because they're worried about operating on the sickest patients. The sickest patients found it harder to get the cardiac surgery. That's not an outcome that we want in that situation, clearly. So is the problem now that we're using transparency? I would argue no. I would argue what the problem is, is measurement, right? Is we're not measuring, in, in this case, the report cards aren't revealing something about how difficult maybe the surgery was in the first place, how sick the patient was. And this kind of, I think, illustrates how tricky in these industrial and social diseases, as I was calling them earlier, or Brandeis was calling them, it, the measurement is and why it, it's so important for us to carefully think about uh, measurement. It's maybe a call to all the accountants uh, to get in, in, in involved in this. Um, on your second question, real quick, I would say the, the primary mechanism, so this arbitrage from sort of the more regulated countries to the less regulated countries is going to be a concern. Um, my guess would be the primary mechanism, again, I would probably prefer that we create carbon pricing and then have the carbon border adjustment tax to uh, combat the carbon leakage. That's probably better than the tools we're going to have on the reporting side. But in the science paper that I mentioned, we do call for mandatory reporting pretty much everywhere. It's just politically it's going to be much harder to get that through. Before going back to the online audience, I believe Professor Garicano had a question. Yes, before. I have an explosive quote. Um, can I have a, can I have a, so, so, sorry, I couldn't reframe myself. It was really fascinating. So, um, first, uh, I wanted to, to ask you to comment on a very related question to the international, which is the, the boundary of the firm issue, the vertical disintegration or horizontal disintegration. So, if BP or Shell or whatever lose dirty assets uh, in favor of some private equity, uh, all their disclosure <clears throat> is going to look better, but the world is not going to be any better because these things are exactly producing as before. How do we deal with, with these boundaries issues? And my second <clears throat> is maybe just more maybe a comment, but also a question, which is um, <clears throat> I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with your comment about broad ESG kind of notation, losing power. Um, <clears throat> we face a crisis, which is climate, an immediate crisis, which we need to solve. That's the uh, environmental part of ESG. And S and G are issues that certain people consider important, other people don't. And what you talked about in the backlash in the US uh, probably has a lot to do with the S and the G. People feel that they don't care about the S, and why are they being forced to, to do certain things? Um, so my question is, is it not the time to bury this ESG thing, go back to E, we have a climate crisis, we need to work on the climate crisis, and uh, try to separate out things that are a huge externality that the whole world deals with, and issues that are important for some people, not for others? Yeah. So um, great questions, and you also earlier asked another good question. I'm not sure um, uh, we can... Let me try to tackle at least uh, most of them. So first on the private equity and kind of selling assets into the, uh, the, the private mm -hmm. firm space is, in my mind, I mean, this, this clearly could be an incentive if we're, again, have uneven regulation where the public firms face more pressure than the private firms. But in my mind, the question does not stop there. I think the next question we should ask, actually, is... Let's say they sell the assets into the private space. Whether or not that's a bad thing or not also has to do something with, A, the regulation that the private firms face, but also whether the private equity firms are better or worse stewards of the assets. And there, we don't have actually that many studies that necessarily say it's going to be worse. So I think we, gotta, we have to be a little bit careful about, you could make arguments that maybe some of their incentives could, if they have more long-run incentives, they could actually have incentives to sort of address some of these things more so than firms that have to um, 
you know, face quarterly reporting and have maybe more short-term pressures. So my sense there would be the verdict uh, on this is still out. But I think this notion of uneven regulation, if we're trying to address externalities, is a very important uh, issue to, to think about because firms will have incentives to respond to that and we need to sort of think about this ex ante. Uh, which gets to the question of like how should we actually measure some of these externalities, which brings us to, I think, the scope three emissions debate that we're also having. And here, m my view would be that, again, if I had my way, I would actually, I'm not a, a big fan of scope three emissions. So for the audience, scope three emissions is where you also report on the emissions in your supply chain, so upstream and also the downstream emissions that come from the use of your products. And a consequence of the scope three emissions is basically massive double counting, right? Because every element in the chain has to report again the same emissions up and down. And in my mind, that also means there's gonna be massive duplication of cost. So what probably is a, is a, would be a smarter mechanism is to say everybody reports their scope one emissions, and then we're gonna create a system that passes on the scope one emissions through the supply chain, right? This is sort of the idea that uh, Bob Kaplan and Karthik Ramana have suggested where we create a VAT-like system, value-added tax, where we're passing on. And that would allow us to do, you know, for instance, product labels with total carbon footprint. You wouldn't have the double counting. You would just have to pass it on. And it would also be a useful input for the carbon border adjustment tax where you would need this as well. So that would be sort of how I would try from, at least from an accounting side, how I would tackle this sort of boundary of the firm issue. And then lastly, on the, um, the uh, you know, should we abandon the S and the G or at least focus just on the E? The Economist had actually an article to that with that notion said maybe we should just focus on the E. The G, I would say we've, we've already tackled or at least have had a very robust debate. There's lots of Governance scholars, even you know, in the in the audience here, people have worked on on governance issues. Um, the S is is tricky, and as you said, creates a lot of these um, uh, debates, especially uh, in the U.S. So, I would be fine with sort of again, as I said before, focusing on things that are externalities, and maybe focusing on the immediate uh, externalities where we face tipping points, like the climate. But I would also at least footnote that I don't think that we can assume that there's no externalities in S. Right? So an example that I'd like to give is let's think about a large you know, box retailer setting up shop just at the outside of a not so large town. If now this town, you know, or that because of that retailer, if lots of the small retailers in the city essentially go under, there's more crime in the streets, people get unemployed, and then they get offloaded onto the social security network. There are certain externalities in the social space as well that I think we should legitimately think about. But they're probably not as urgent as you were pointing out as some of the, the E issues. Thank you. I believe we have questions from the online audience. Perhaps. There is a question from Tibe Bosman from the University of Amsterdam uh, that revolves around the liability of regulators. Given the importance of the topic, uh, in some setting, regulators can be sued for ill research regulation. In other setting, they don't. What are your views on uh, the liability of regulators on this specific setting? I've not thought too much about sort of liability in a, in a legal sense where you actually take them um, to um, court, um, you know, I think there's some research around this. So even in our fracking setting, we actually do find that post the disclosure mandates that lawsuits um, targeting the regulator are increasing. So we don't find lawsuits for liability of the frac fracking operators, which in part has to do with relatively high standards in the US in terms of their legal liability. But we do see lawsuits targeting essentially the regulator, asking the regulator to act either to ban or you know, take certain actions. So it, the effect is certainly there. And there's a couple other studies that would say 
that by providing more transparency, people then also put more pressure on the enforcement mechanism or the regulator, and that could be helpful to the extent that the enforcement was lax uh, in the first place. So that would be sort of the way I would start sort of thinking about this. Uh, you know, the, the, as always, I think with litigation, there's going to be some pros and cons. Uh, but to the extent that enforcement is weak, sort of targeting the regulator could be part of the solution as well. You can perhaps take some questions from the back. I believe there was a question here. Are you uh, yeah. And then another question there in the middle. Hi, good evening. Thanks for the presentation first. Uh, I have a quick question on, um, so we know so that if society... If you could please just introduce yourself and... Yeah, can you hear me well? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Dylan Shonke. I'm an alumni. So I used to work in, in finance before and it was actually a big topic, ESG, which came actually from society as well. So we know that ESG factor was actually like bringing a lot of investment from institutional clients. Uh, except perhaps in Texas, where hedge funds are still not focusing on ESG. But my question is, so we have peer benchmarking, as you said. But the, the, the problem is with peer benchmarking, I believe, that the, the targets are actually not high enough, and we don't focus enough on the environmental issue, as we said, because the measurement of those externalities, as you mentioned, are maybe not measurable except when we look at death people from flooding or earthquake or tornadoes in the US, which actually is starting to come to the West and now we are starting to finally focus on that. So my question is how can we accelerate this like this process, not only from society but maybe from a financial market perspective, which actually bring a lot of uh, regulation and uh, process forward. I mean, so I think this connects a little bit with my earlier response to Maria's first question is that I think when it comes to ESG in investing, I think the effects have been to some extent either muted or, or maybe even in the wrong direction because I think there was a, a, a massive shift from when this topic took off um, to today where investors were shifting into these, um, you know, either ESG funds or stocks that were perceived to be having greener or better profiles on the various ESG metrics. And then that obviously is a demand effect that basically drives up the prices, drives up, created these large returns, and then that created a feedback me mechanism where people were basically arguing, see, they have higher returns, therefore we should buy them. I think that was, um, is an issue. And... <coughs> To the extent, or once this sort of transition has taken place, I think the expectation of people should be that um, if it is true that it costs money to ex address externalities, for which I think there is sort of a solid foundation, then you would expect that these um, ESG investments often will have lower returns going forward, right? either because the brown firms have higher risks or because the green firms or people have preferences for these green firms. Once that sort of is sorted out, I think the financial markets will provide incentives in the right direction. It's just not clear to me that these incentives are going to be so big. Right? So th let's also think about the following. A lot of the firms that are considered green are often firms that have relatively low carbon footprints to begin with. Right? It's going to be insurance companies, <coughs> banks, service companies. The firms that really move the dial and that really need to change are going to be the brown firms. And so this is where I feel like ESG ratings and measurement, again, play a tremendous role. What we need to figure out how we meaningfully reward the firms that make changes. Right? So if we exclude brown firms in general and don't invest in them, and they don't get the capital to make the transitions, then the money is in the wrong place because if the insurance companies all further reduce their carbon footprint in the banks, it's not going to be enough. We need the brown firms to really change their ways. And this is why it's important. I think, again, this is why I was making sort of this blended finance argument earlier or saying it's important to fund sustainability where firms meaningfully commit to making investments into the energy transition into sustainable finance or sustainable activities, which then... Uh, create sort of lower carbon emissions and lower, lower environmental impact, and that should be rewarded. And for what we need for that is better measurement. And I think the, 
the mess that we still have seen with ESG ratings is at the moment, I think, creating part of the issue that I think you're referring to. And, but it's also really early in the space. I think the, the measurement is very tricky and we're, we, we need to sort through this. But this is, again, why I would say, why don't we focus on the key things? And for carbon, it's not that hard. Biodiversity is more complex, but I think this would do a lot of good if we focused on those things as opposed to trying to measure, measure everything under the sun. So we can perhaps take our last question right there in the middle of the lecture theater. If you could please state your name and affiliation. So my name is Elias. I'm a current student here. And uh, I found your presentation quite interesting. And I was wondering, you showed very impressive numbers according, according to like, what the impact could be. But what about like, the timeline? What, how thi what do you think, like, how long does it take actually to these um, measures actually take place and have an impact? Because like, the climate crisis is also like, very like, time critical. So if it takes like 20 years, this would be probably too long. So do you have any view on this or like, some data? So let me start from the back. I, I, I do think we should very seriously think about to uh, basically jumpstart and accelerate the, the energy transition uh, about sort of a two-pronged approach. You know, it would be great, as I was saying earlier, most economists would agree that a carbon tax would be a way to really get action fast. It doesn't, it's not clear that that's in the cards, at least in a, in a, on a global scale. But we should also think about subsidies because ultimately what we're having here is, a, is our two externalities, right? It's not just the carbon externalities we've talked a lot about, but there's also R&D spillovers which lead to people underinvesting. investing I, I'm a firm believer, I mean, there's lots of new innovation that's coming sort of almost every day when you read the news, you, you, you hear about companies coming up with new stuff. But I think if we were to provide sort of, you know, meaningful um, subsidies, you could jumpstart and make this process a lot um, faster. And that's something that we should think about considering how big the problems are, as you were um, alluding to. Um, the other part that relates to the timing that I confess I also didn't appreciate until I started also talking more to companies is I think people often have an expectation that we should see sort of improvements year over year in a fairly linear fashion. And I think that that's fairly unrealistic. Once you think about how many of these improvements in technology are going to come that I was just referring to. Right? In many cases, the big improvements are going to come when firms change their assets. So one other thing we need to carefully think about is investment cycles. You know, if you're a chemical company and you, have, you operate crackers, you know, once you install a cracker, you're going to have, that cracker is going to be in place for 20 years, 25 years. And so once that cracker is in place, you're going to have very limited chances to make changes. And so again, if we want to have sort of some partnership between the private sector and the public sector, back to my point about that some subsidies might be in order to get changes, is we should think about when firms are making these big investments and these big changes, because if they don't make the right choices during those times, then we're going to be locked in for a considerable uh, amount of time. And so that would be sort of my other thought on the timing question that you had. So we can perhaps wrap up. It has been a great pleasure for me and I believe also for all of you here and on online to listen to Professor Christian Lloyds. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Maria. For taking time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.